Um, welcome everybody. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Gary Bader. Um, I'm going to give you guys uh, this morning's introduction to the gene list workshop and cover, uh, tell you a little bit more about what interpreting gene lists and, and pathway and network analysis is uh, and cover some basics that will be useful for the rest of the, the workshop. Um, okay, so the basis of this workshop is that you uh, usually have some kind of uh, screen or, or genomic experiment that you've done and uh, taken, you know, it's taken maybe a while to get to the, the data stage and you've gotten your data and, um, and, and everything's working and you're, you're like, great, everything's working with this new technology that I'm using. But then you realize that you have thousands of genes that, that are differently expressed or bound to your transcription factor and now you're wondering how am I going to sort through all of this, these thousands of genes. I definitely don't want to do it one by one. Um, and so that's where this, this workshop comes in. Um, basically, we, at this stage, generally want to know what's interesting about these genes in some way. And a very popular way of looking, finding out what's interesting about a set of genes is that uh, you want to find out how they relate to biology that we already know, uh, how the cell works, um, information about biological pathways, complexes, gene functions. Um, so typically, often, and, and um, a lot of... Uh, um, my labs and, and Quaid and, and Lincoln later are going to use gene expression data as a main type of data that we're using as an example. But the analysis that we're uh, going to tell you about, and, and also Wyeth um, will tell you about, is very general to any kind of gene list or um, in, in the particular areas that we're, we're going to be talking about. So um, one way that people get a gene list from gene expression data, for instance, is they, they uh, rank um, uh, they, they, they might have a experiment that they've done and they compare the gene expression in the experiment to control and this is the same for methylation or, or any other kind of differential experiment where you want to find out how different genes are acting in, in a particular in your experiment compared to control and so you might get a ranking or a big list of genes that's differentially expressed for instance. Um, if you have lots of different experiments, lots of time points, lots of samples, you can cluster the inf that, that, uh, those samples and cluster the genes by how uh, similar their expression pattern is, for instance, across the samples. And that also can give you a gene list. So it's the list of genes that are acting similarly across your experiment. So there's, there's different ways of getting this gene list, and we'll talk about more in a, in a little bit. And then what we want to do with this question here is compare it to information about pathways uh, that we already know, um, and ideally we find something interesting, um, like a causative gene that we're, you know, for, for our, uh, that we were looking for. Okay, so pathway and network analysis is really any type of analysis that involves pathway or network information. It's most commonly applied to help interpret gene lists, um, and uh, um, the most popular type probably is pathway enrichment analysis, but there are many others that are useful, and we're going to talk about more than just this type of analysis. Uh, and it, it helps gain mechanistic insight into genomics data. And I like to think about it more and more about uh, how pathway network information can help you get some insight into the mechanistic details of how things are working, which is really telling you something about, ideally, the cause. Uh, if you see some effect in your experiment, uh, you see a whole bunch of genes changing, you might do some pathway analysis and you see that those genes can be thought of in terms of pathway activity and pathways are changing. Uh, and but you're wondering why are those pathways changing? You might be able to find some reason. Um, for instance, a splice factor or transcription factor is changing. Um, that's sort of the promise. It's just not always that easy to get there, but definitely the more mechanistic uh, insight we can get into our data, the more likely you are to get access to something uh, causative. So, um, and in general, uh, but we're kind of moving in, in pathway analysis more towards this causation idea from a correlation idea, which is most popular in genomics. So, for instance, uh, the gene expression data that I showed you when we cluster data, it's all based on correlation between gene profiles, for instance. Or in GWAS, genome-wide association studies, we find genetic markers that are correlated with disease, and it doesn't tell us that those genetic markers are, that's a mutation that's causing the disease. It says that there's some mutation nearby, maybe, that's somehow correlated with the phenotype. Um, so this is, these, these correlation approaches are very powerful. Um, there's a few issues with, with these. Uh, one, um, they generate a huge amount of data sometimes, 
And um, for instance, in genome-wide association studies, uh, the more um, and there's sort of a, a little bit of a paradox here. The, the, the better genomic technology gets, the more data we get out of it, right? And, um, and sometimes if you're looking for association in gene, genome-wide association studies, for instance, that can reduce the, the, the statistical power of the approach because you have so much information, you're trying to find that signal. Um, you um, want to, and if you keep on, for instance, doing correlation tests or multiple, um, various different types of statistical tests, you have to correct for the, the, uh, that multiple testing, which we'll talk about um, tomorrow, I think. Um, also, there's uh, there's some issues with uh, signal to noise. So if you have uh, the important parts, you know, signal in your data is, is very rare, then um, you really need a lot of samples to find it. Otherwise, you won't be able to get you know, sort of get access to that signal. So um, this, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, pathway, using pathway information in, um, to help so address these questions or these problems. Um, so for instance, when we're thinking about human genetics or, or gen, uh, gene, gene uh, variants that are associated with a uh, phenotype, um, we might, instead of thinking about lots of different individual variants, we can think about an individual pathway and how it's affected. Uh, and we might see that lots of different mutations are affecting the pathway in different ways. Um, and when we think about the when we think about the individual mutations, we don't see how they're connected. But when we think about the pathway, we see this really nice strong signal. Um, I'll give you an example of, of how that works soon. Um, okay, so uh, I I want to also mention that before the analysis, um, we're not going to cover these things. We expect that the genomics technology that you use should be appropriately normalized, uh, the background should be adjusted, and there should be the appropriate and relevant quality control measures taken. Um, each genomic technology and every generation of genomic technology has its own ways of doing this, and usually, more increasingly, people are kind of going to core facilities to get a lot of the genomics done, or it's becoming more of a service. Um, and so, uh, however you, you're getting your, your, your uh, data um, processed, the people who are processing your data I usually recommend as the experts. Um, how many people work with a core facility to get their data uh, processed? How many people do all of the what, sequencing themselves or gene expression microarray uh, reading themselves? Okay, a few people. So um, the um, so we, we kind of assume that there's knowledge already in place to help do this properly. In particular, to use statistics that will increase in, uh, signal and reduce noise, specifically for your type of experiment, um, and um, that's important. So, I'm going to uh, just present an example of a successful pathway analysis that we were involved in, uh, that we did uh, a few years ago. Um, this was for a study in collaboration with Steve Scherer, who works at the Hospital for Sick Children, um, who studies uh, among other things, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, he was uh, interested in, he studies the genetics of autism spectrum disorder, uh, and when I got involved in this project, I was surprised to learn how, how heritable it is, that there's 60 to 90 percent concordance among I identical twins, um, not as much with siblings. Um, although there's, you know, in, in typical, uh, in, uh, as is typically the case with complex diseases, uh, not a lot of heritability had been explained, only 5 to 15 percent from rare single gene disorders and chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, although they had some clues at this time, this was published in 2010, that de novo rare copy number variants may play a role. And so they wanted to study these further, and they mapped copy number variants in around 900 cases and over 1,000 controls, uh, children who had severe autism spectrum disorder in the cases. Uh, they used the Illumina Infinium 1 million single SNP chip at the time to do this. Um, the SNP array gives you an intensity of a particular uh, SNP or DNA um, level um, at the, the germline level for across the genome. And then they process this to look for, um, say, for instance, regions of the genome that have no intensity. Uh, no measured DNA, and those are that a region of deletion, a region of the, the DNA that has a much higher intensity than you expect, and that's a, an amplification region. So they processed using different algorithms to get access to, to basically um, 
convert the SNPs to copy number variants, which are, are larger, and they uh, found hundreds of them. Um, they, they were only interested in the rare ones, so they only they, they removed all the, the, the big common ones, which there weren't that many of, um, and focused on ones that were present in less than 1%. And then they, they looked for genes that were in these uh, copy number variant regions, either deleted or amplified, that were correlated with the phenotype of interest with autism spectrum disorder. And they found a few genes that were significant, but, um, but they didn't have enough statistical significance to get lots of genes. So really, there was just a few genes. So what we wanted to do was try to see how, as I mentioned earlier, how pathways were associated with the, the phenotype instead of individual genes. And when we did this, and Daniela Merico, uh, who's a postdoc in my lab at the, at the time, did this analysis, we found a rich um, set of pathways that were really strongly associated with this phenotype. And um, all of the circles here represent pathways, and the connections represent pathway crosstalk, and I'll show you how to make uh, images like this in, uh, in, in the later part of this workshop. Um, uh, all of these, these circles here represent pathways that are strongly associated with, with autism spectrum disorder. Um, here's one that's uh, uh, focused on central nervous system development, which made sense. Some of these other ones are more signaling related. And um, what we found when we looked at some of these pathways, like regulation of cell proliferation or um, these these particular pathways in um, in central nervous system development, like cell projection and organization, um, we found that uh, there weren't an there wasn't really an individual mutation that was affecting the same gene over and over again in, in across 900 patients, uh, 900 cases. Instead, the pathway was affected over and over again, but it was different genes. And if we didn't use pathway information, we would never have been able to see that signal. So we get this really nice, we get a fairly weak signal with those individual genes because there are only one or two effect, uh, affected genes across 900 samples. But when we look at the pathway, we see more than a dozen cases that are affected or 20 cases that are affected. Um, and that, that ends up being a very strong signal in this data set. Okay, so that's an example of the, um, the uh, a good example of pathway analysis that shows you the explains the or um, how to increase statistical power here by getting more signal out of the data, um, and it also helps dealing with these large gene lists because instead of having thousands of genes, we now have sort of a few major functional themes here like cell prol proliferation and GTPase RAS signaling. Those are those are sort of central themes in this data, it seems. Okay, so now I'm going to go and switch topics to uh, a more basic introduction about gene lists, and uh, that's mostly in preparation for some of the, the, the future uh, lectures in the course. So I, I mentioned this already. Where did gene lists come from? I mentioned some of this already. So a lot of gene lists come from molecular profiling, uh, using technology to f measure all the mRNA transcripts, protein levels, as much as many proteins as you can um, in the in your sample of interest. And um, there are two major kind of ways of thinking about this data. One is uh, just identifying all of the genes or proteins. Often in proteomics, we, we all is changing now, um, but classically proteomics often just identified all the proteins. So you could say proteins were there or they weren't detected, um, although now we're, people are getting more quantitative information. Um, and so there's certain types of experiments that just give you a gene list without any values associated with them. We just know they're there or not there or not detected. Um, we can also quantify uh, levels of these um, molecules that were studying. And so we got the gene list, we identify the genes, uh, and we also have some values associated with them, like gene expression, we know the, the, the genes, high, you know, highly expressed or not expressed. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, we can rank or cluster these using standard biostatistics or bioinformatics methods um, to uh, um, process these. And these can also sometimes generate gene lists, like I mentioned before. We can also get gene lists from protein intera molecular interaction type assays. So if we do, uh, if we have a set of proteins that interacts with another protein or a set of um, uh, targets of a microRNA or transcription factor binding sites and the genes that they might be connected to, this also defines a set of genes. Usually we don't have a ranking for these. Um, genetic screen, we do an siRNA 
uh, screen or association studies uh, like the, the genome-wide association studies that I mentioned where people are using some kind of genetic markers like single nucleotide polymorphisms to uh, see what changes in the genome associate with the phenotype. Okay, so because gene lists come from multiple different sources, you need to, uh, and we're trying to explain how to interpret gene lists in general, before you do that, before you use the methods that we'll, we'll be talking about in this course, you need to understand what your gene list means, and some of the methods might be applicable better, more or less applicable to some of these types of gene lists. So some gene lists are really about a biological system. So we might get a set of genes in our gene list that's associated with a protein complex or physical interactions or a pathway. Uh, we might find genes that are related because they have a similar function, like they're all protein kinases. They might be similar because they're part of, they're present in the same part of the cell or tissue, uh, or they might be present in a, in a region of the genome. Um, and uh, you do need to um, think about what your gene list means. Is it does it mean something about bio biochemical mechanisms? Does it mean something about um, a, a set of genes on a genome that's not really necessarily related to biochemical mechanism? And we're looking for one gene in that in that gene list. Um, so um, you know, we, step one is to kind of con just consider that, which is generally most people uh, already do this naturally, but just to make it clear that. Um, you know, hopefully this is part of your experimental design. You need to sort of think about your, your question. Uh, and then some of the, the, the frequently asked questions are what, you know, just the most basic one is, you know, I have a bunch of genes. What, what genes, what types of genes are they? So you can summarize your biological processes or other aspects of gene function using pathway analysis. Um, we, people sometimes are interested in differential analysis, like tumor versus normal, uh, and you can... So you see what's different, and then you want to know what pathways are different between the samples. Um, and that might tell you something about the pathways that are involved in disease development in that case. Um, you might, this is a very popular one that's a little bit difficult sometimes to answer, but Wyeth is going to tell you about this this, this afternoon. Um, people are very interested in finding a controller, uh, like a master regulator for um, their, you know, path, their process of interest, a transcription factor or a microRNA that might be kind of explaining why things are changing. You might also be interested in finding new pathways or pathway members. So many people who do an siRNA screen, they are usually have a phenotype of interest and they're trying to figure out uh, which genes are involved in that phenotype. And they are looking for any kind of pathways or um, any, you know, genes that might be part of the pathway that leads to that phenotype. So they're interested in discovering new gene function there. And, and also, as I mentioned, with the GWAS and the autism study, correlating with the disease or phenotype. Okay, so there are a number of different pathway analysis methods that help answer these questions. And in particular, during this workshop, we're going to focus on uh, regulatory and network analysis uh, from Wyeth the, the, the remainder of the day today, after I finished. And um, tomorrow we're going to talk about pathway and uh, so regulatory network analysis helps find controllers, regulators. Uh, pathway enrichment analysis helps summarize and compare, so summarization and differential analysis. And network analysis, which we'll talk more about on day three, is uh, and and um, maybe a little bit tomorrow is useful for help for predicting gene function finding new members of a pathway, identifying functional modules in your data, which might be new pathways. Okay, any questions so far? Any other gene lists that people um, work with? Yeah? Uh, I, I wonder, related to the, uh, the gene list idea, that we, we come with our own gene list, but uh, in other sense, there's a lot of other gene lists out there that people sometimes want to compare their gene lists to. So maybe this is premature, but I wonder if we're going to get into that a little bit in terms of the kinds of resources we yeah, so, so the question is, uh, other people have generated interesting gene lists, and how do we compare our gene lists to, to those? And, and the, the pathway enrichment analysis is, um, that, we'll, that we'll talk about is really about that. It's comparing your gene list to other gene lists. Often those gene lists are sets of genes that are involved in a pathway, but they could be other people's gene lists that they've previously found, like the set of genes that's known to be associated with the phenotype. Uh, and some of the databases that we'll use actually have collected a lot of those in one place to make it 
conveniently accessible. But you can also collect your own gene list and use some of the same statistics to, to do comparisons. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, okay, so this is getting, uh, now switching topics to sort of basic background information that we found is very useful to just get everyone on the same page with uh, before we start the uh, go into the detailed analysis in the rest of the workshop. Um, so um, the one of the first types of um, uh, pathway analysis or one of the, the, the most common types of pathway analysis that we'll be talking about mostly tomorrow is pathway enrichment analysis and what it uh, needs. So basically you're looking for if you have a, a list of genes, uh, you're looking to see if there's a pathway that's enriched in that list more than you would expect. So say you're interested, you have a thousand genes, and you are interested, um, and you see that a lot of those genes seem to be involved in the cell cycle. And you know that there are, you know, one percent of the genome is involved in the cell cycle. So you can look in your gene list and you can ask, is there more than one percent involved in the cell cycle or fewer than 1%. So if there's 10% of your gene list that's involved in the cell cycle, it's 10 times more enriched than you would expect given what just what you know about cell cycle genes in the genome. So that's the basis of, of pathway enrichment analysis. And, um, and there's a number of tools that are available to do that, which we'll talk about uh, in, in detail. And the, um, but the, the basic idea before using these tools is that you need some kind of gene list and you need some kind of attributes of those genes which could come from pathway databases, for instance. These are um, uh, um, lists of pathway, you know, lists of pathways and the genes that they um, contain. So um, I'm going to talk about these briefly um, because the, uh, this, there's sort of some a, a few issues to consider here. Um, okay, so uh, very briefly, just talking quickly about gene and protein identifiers. Um, the idea of an identifier is that it's some unique number or name for something. So if you were, you know, have a social security or social insurance number, um, or your gene has an entree gene ID, these are numbers that are ideally not changing over the life of the gene, um, and the uh, and they're ideally unique so that when you, if I tell you I'm talking about gene. 41232, uh, you will understand what I mean because that gene is always being called this number in this entree gene database. Um, if that's not the case, then, then there, you can, it can lead to problems. Um, so, um, there, gene, uh, so one of the issues is um, with, uh, so this is a basic idea, um, but there are a few issues with this um, idea in practice. One is that there are lots of different pathway databases that, uh, and gene and, and protein information databases that exist. And each one has their own way of numbering and naming genes. Um, there are also different types of records uh, for the gene, the DNA, the RNA. There might be more than one RNA coming from a DNA, and the same thing with proteins. Um, and so it's, it's important to recognize the, the correct record type when you're talking about gene lists. So here's, here's a gene list with uh, gene symbols, human gene symbols. So these really talk about a gene. They don't necessarily talk about splice variants of the of the gene. Um, and uh, for instance, Entree Gene, which is a major database from the uh, U.S. National um, Center for Biotechnology Information, they don't store protein sequence or DNA sequence. They just have the idea of the gene uh, described, and then they link to other databases that contain that information. And the NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information in the U.S., that it keeps a huge amount of information that's useful, um, has a very complicated set of databases that have lots of connections between them. Uh, you don't have to know all of these, but it's useful to know that there's, when you use the websites, there might be a lot of databases behind the scenes, and so you might actually get different identifiers depending on which database you're in. And here's a list of a whole bunch of different identifiers uh, that are, of, you know, um, commonly seen. And uh, the ones that are recommended are in red and even more recommended are in bolded red. So entree gene is very useful um, and species specific gene uh, identifiers like human gene names from that are official, human gene symbols uh, or similar symbols that are official from model organism databases are, are often useful to use. Um, and some of these others are just you can sort of see how they all, this is just a, a bunch of examples to see how diverse they are. 
Okay, so there's lots of different identifiers, and um, one of the problems you might have when you're using pathway network analysis tools, uh, we've tried to select tools that kind of recognize common identifiers, but one of the problems you might have is that you have some identifiers from your your uh, technology that you're using, and it's not read by the system. So for instance, you've used Affymetrics microarrays, or you've, you've used, um, and these are getting less and less useful as RNA-seq comes, becomes uh, more popular, but um, there's still a lot of use of chips and specific uh, platforms that have specific identifiers for genes. So if you ever use a chip platform, microarray platform, often there's specific microarray platform specific or um, identifiers for, for genes, and you need to map these to some, some set of uh, natural set of gene, gene identifiers, like human gene symbols. Um, and uh, the, um, there's a number of services available, which I'll mention, uh, and I just want to mention quickly the, uh, oops, some of the challenges um, with, with identifiers. So before I, I get there, so um, one of the issues that can happen if you don't have, um, if you have a, if you're working with gene identifiers that are not uh, unique or they're changing over time, is that you might make some mistakes if you are using these services and mapping identifiers and there's a mistake made. So you can sometimes, um, if you're not using, if you're using protein names, for instance, which are not, um, which are very ambiguous, uh, and, and gene synonyms, which are very ambiguous, um, often you can tell the system, I'm looking for uh, p53, and it converts it to some other gene, which, because there's multiple genes that have a synonym called p53. Um, so um, this, is, this is, all of these names here are actually synonyms for, p, for what often people call p53, the protein level, but the official gene symbol is tp53. So this is the one that, the one that you should use. So sometimes it's confusing to see that there's, you know, these look similar, or people often call this gene by this name, but this is the official gene name, and so the point is we should stick to official names as possible, because <laughs> they reduce this, um, this uh, ambiguity problem. Another problem that occurs sometimes is that Excel, which is pretty popular, how many people use Excel? Okay, quite a few. Um, so Excel tries to be smart, um, but it's, it's smart, but for accounting or something like that, so it's not smart for biology. So sometimes you can have important genes that you type in and it, it changes it to a date. It recognizes like OCT4, important transcription factor, it thinks it's October 4th, so by, by default. So how many people have seen this, this problem? Okay, so um, the, uh, and this is, this is not a problem if you're just typing the gene in because you can correct it, but if you paste 5,000 genes into Excel and number 4,302 gets changed, then you might not realize it, and then you copy it, and it, it, uh, you, you may have lost that gene because future software doesn't recognize it. Um, so the way to, and I think I, I uh, should have used Veronique's uh, updated slides here, but I, I have a, a couple of tips later, but the way to avoid this is to um, uh, copy as text um, when you paste uh, um, information to Excel, um, paste as, as text into text formatted um, columns. Um, there's also interest, uh, use, it's also, there are sometimes problems reaching 100% coverage. So if I give you a list of 1,000 genes and you type it into a pathway network analysis, you paste it into a pathway network analysis program, the pathway network analysis program might only recognize 95% of them or something like that. So um, you might lose a few percent because I might have used I might have an old gene list that I gave you from an older publication, and some of the names have now changed slightly um, because they were gene names that had systematic names, and now people have given them an official gene symbol that, that um, is more human readable, for instance. So there's version issues, um, and if you ever come across this, often these days, especially if you're working with certain organisms that are more well studied, you won't have such a problem with this, but if you do come across this issue, then you should try to use multiple uh, sources to map information or multiple paths. So if you have um, certain genes that are mapping well, like 95%, take the last 5% that aren't mapping and try them in different different websites and see if you can get um, information from other websites that might have more up-to-date versions. And just as a cautionary note, there was um, a paper uh, when I was a, a postdoc that was um, people were really excited about in the lab, and then they quickly realized that um, this paper in Nature um, about uh, microRNA target 
uh, particular microRNA target. The, the people had said HES1 is a microRNA target, but then they didn't realize that there's two HES1s. One is homolog of ES1, and the other one's hairy enhancer of split. Um, so they were both called HES1 in the database, and they actually did a search at some point in their, their experiments that gave them the wrong one, and um, they did all experiments on the wrong one and then had to retract their paper, unfortunately. So um, it, is, it does happen. Um, so there are uh, a couple of uh, different identifier mapping services uh, that are websites that you can go to and type, paste a, a whole bunch of genes and then convert them to another set. So here I'm converting gene symbols to entree gene IDs using Synergizer, uh, and there's a, there's a few others. Okay, so um, just a, some quick recommendations. Um, for proteins and genes, uh, we should uh, try to use gene identifiers, either entree gene IDs or the official gene symbol, and um, you might need to uh, use different web different websites to do um, conversion if you don't get 100% uh, conversion or manually curate the missing mappings and and be careful of these Excel auto conversions so remember to format everything as text before pasting or paste um, as text um, this doesn't consider splice form variants so one of the uh, this and in general this course is and the tools presented in this course in general pathway network analysis are really or, oriented around genes. Um, we just don't have enough information about uh, the differences in function between different splice variants uh, on a genome-wide scale to uh, do a lot of this analysis when we're considering different splice variants. So it's a question that, that often gets asked and the uh, in the future will be better when more when we have more higher resolution data coming out and presumably all the RNA seq data that everybody's producing now will give us a lot better picture a more accurate picture of the splice variants that are present in different tissues and um, and in different disease conditions uh, and then once we know about those then people can do experiments and test the different you know functions between the different uh, splice variants but right now we you know there's a lot of information known about them but not on a genome wide basis compared to just looking at the gene level. Okay, so uh, that was a quick introduction to genes uh, and, and, and identifiers um, and, and some of the um, caveats that you just have to be aware of when you're working with large gene lists. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to next talk about this part here, um, gene attributes, which are pathways or functions of genes and um, sort of the second thing that's sort of used for pathway enrichment analysis. Um, there, uh, there's actually a huge amount of information about gene function that's available in databases. Uh, information about the function of the gene, the chromosome position, disease association, um, transcription factors that might regulate it, uh, protein properties, whether there's any protein domains that have a known function that are, that are on the proteins, interactions with other genes and proteins, and you know, uh, a lot of this information can be used for, for pathway network analysis. So I'll just talk about this uh, first, this function annotation, um, where we want to know something about the biological processes that the gene's involved in, the molecular function that the uh, gene pr product, the, the protein might carry out, or where the gene is expressed and where the protein is expressed. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, an important source of this information that is quite useful in a lot of the uh, rest of the, the, the course. How many people know about gene ontology already? Okay, how many people have never heard of gene ontology? Okay, so most people have heard of it, almost everyone's heard of it, and probably just over half of, uh, know about it in, in more detail. So um, I'm going to give an introduction to this, uh, and um, even if you know about gene ontology, you might, you might there might, might still be some useful points here. So gene ontology is a project that has been running for more than a decade that uh, tries to create, uh, capture all of the concepts in biology in a big dictionary. So concepts like protein kinase, apoptosis, membrane, um, and this dictionary has the, the, the word or the phrase and a, and a definition. Um, and so it's quite useful as a source of biological definitions, but it's also an ontology. An ontology is a, a formal system for describing knowledge, and in this case, 
um, gene ontology, uh, the ontology aspect incorporates relationships between terms. So, uh, and in particular, the terms are structured hierarchically from most general to most specific. So here's a specific ter term at the bottom here, B-cell apoptosis, um, and it's related to some of these other terms. There's two major types of relationships, is a and part of. So B-cell apoptosis is a type of apoptosis, which is a type of programmed cell death, and you go all the way up, it's a type of death, it's a type of physiological process. Uh, and B-cell apoptosis is also part of B-cell homeostasis. So it's, it's a component of B-cell homeostasis. So those are two major types of relationships. Uh, and just important to understand this hierarchical structure here because when you are looking at gene ontology information, and this, this gene ontology is sort of a, a major source of pathway information that we use for pathway analysis, um, this, uh, there, there, it describes gene function at multiple levels, levels of detail. So you might find that you get a very specific term coming back from the analysis that is um, you know, B-cell apoptosis, or you might find that you get something more general like physiological process. And the, um, it just, uh, so that's one aspect that's, that's important to note. And it's also, uh, terms can have more than one parent or child. So here, cell death is a type of uh, death, and it's a type of cellular physiological process. So the, um, this, this structure usually means that when you have a gene associated with one of these terms, you often have a lot of other terms automatically associated. You can also have multiple terms um, associated to your, to your gene in, in uh, different ways. So that's sometimes challenging to work with because you, you get lots of information coming back from, from an individual gene. Um, so gene ontology covers, I kind of mentioned it already, cellular component, which is where in the cell things are expressed, molecular function, uh, what enzymatic function is, for instance, and biological process, which is really pathways in general. And there's two parts. There's the terms, which I explained. Uh, terms are uh, added by editors at uh, professional professional uh, people who spend most of their time uh, curating gene ontology, and uh, people can also add terms by request. There's over 30,000 terms, 20, 23,000 biological process terms, so there's 23,000 pathway terms with definitions. Um, not as many, many, many fewer cellular locations, so only about 3,000, and just over 90, or around 9,400 molecular functions. This is as of this year, I should have put 2013. Um, so uh, the second part of gene ontology is the annotations. This is really the valuable part for us uh, because we're using this, we'll be using this annotation um, mostly uh, starting tomorrow. Um, the uh, uh, annotations are where people take terms from the dictionary and link them to genes. So uh, it's not just, um, so you might know um, you might have a gene and you say, okay, this is a protein kinase. This encodes a protein kinase. So it's not just that you take the term and you link it. You also provide additional information, including the evidence of how, why you've linked it. Um, so the, uh, these associations are um, sometimes known as annotations or gene associations or go-annotations. As I mentioned, there's multiple annotations per gene. And uh, the other important thing to know is that um, some of these gene ontology annotations are created automatically without any human review. So there's a lot that are cur curated by scientists that are very high quality, um, but they're more time consuming to create. So there's also some automated methods that predict gene function and then somebody reviews it to make sure that the system's working properly. So those, those are also good. And then there's electronic annotation, which is um, de derived from uh, automated processes that nobody looks at, nobody checks. I mean, somebody programmed it to make sure that it's working as best it can, but in the end, it's predictions. Uh, it's, it's mostly computational predictions. The accuracy varies. Sometimes computational predictions can be very accurate. So, for instance, if you give me a protein, I can tell you with almost perfect confidence that whether that protein will have a transmembrane domain or not, based on sequence uh, analysis. And then if you we're looking for proteins that are exp expressed in the membrane, you would be able to predict that pretty perfectly almost um, using computational methods. Um, others are, are lower quality and, um, and, and their, you know, the prediction accuracy might be closer to 70% or 60%. So, um, so in general, people treat this, this part of gene ontology annotations with 
uh, caution. Um, although they're useful, if you don't have any uh, manual annotation, this happens for uh, genes that are less well studied and also organisms where you haven't had a lot of study about that organism, you, people haven't studied that organism a lot and you have just sequenced its genome for instance and then all of the annotations are usually predicted by orthology from a nearby organism that might have some gene ontology that's being curated. So key, the key point is to be aware of where this, this information is coming from. Um, and this, these are different evidence codes, just for your information. So all of these guys here are um, experimental evidence codes, and these are evidence codes that are traceable back to the literature somehow, like a traceable author statement. Um, and these evidence codes would include the publication reference of where this is uh, coming from. Um, computational analysis evidence codes, like inferred from sequence or structural similarity. Uh, and then IEA is the big one that's electronic annotation that doesn't is not uh, reviewed. So just to know, sometimes you see this IEA means inferred from electronic annotation. Okay, I mentioned a little bit already that the species coverage of gene ontology is not um, uh, perfect across all species. Um, it's far from that. Major eukaryotic model organisms and human are covered quite well. Uh, several bacterial and parasite species through uh, various different databases are covered, and um, there's always new species annotations and development, and you can always look at the Gene Ontology website to see the current list. And here's um, a little bit of an older slide, but it, it gets the point across that there's um, variable coverage, and it's not just variable coverage of annotations, it's variable coverage of curated annotations versus electronic annotations. So here are a, a number of uh, genomes, uh, organisms, and this uh, y-axis measures the percent of genes in this genome with annotation. So here, this, this guy here is, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, one of the first sequenced, well, first sequenced eukaryotic genomes and has been studied for a long time. And the Saccharomyces genome database has basically reviewed all literature available that's ever published on yeast and on budding yeast and assigned a gene ontology term manually to every gene. Some of, a lot of those genes are unknown, but they, they still assign a, an unknown term in that case, and they've, they've actually done a literature search to check that it's unknown. Um, and, um, you know, here's a, another one here that has some, um, this is, I can't remember the uh, first name of this, Fumigatus, I, can, I, I used to know this. Um, sorry? Asperger, yeah, Asperger. so this is a, um, another fungus, right, um, that is, uh, has some manual coverage, um, non-electronic annotation sources, um, and then most of it is predicted, um, so electronic annotation. Okay, so this is a number of databases that contribute to the gene ontology uh, project, and the, uh, just for your information, with some links, and uh, they, they also make available some other forms of gene ontology. So I mentioned that gene ontology annotations can often have multiple annotations per gene. And this is usually good because it provides extra information about the function of the gene. But sometimes when people want to do certain things with their, with their functions, um, in particular often, especially early on, people wanted to create a pie chart that said, okay, here's... I have a thousand genes from proteomic study, and here is their distribution of um, of uh, cellular locations in general. So, um, it, when you have thousands of gene ontology terms and lots of terms per gene, sometimes it's actually difficult to make a pie chart like this because a lot of the terms are specific. And if you make a pie chart with one thousand wedges, it won't be able to. It won't be very useful. So, um, the gene ontology project has created a few what they call slim versions of gene ontology, uh, where they uh, have created a reduced set of terms that are more general. And there's a generic version, there's a plant version, there's a yeast version, there's some other versions. And so sometimes you can get your gene ontology terms mapped to the slim version, and that might be useful for higher level summaries. Uh, there are lots of tools that are available for gene ontology that um, uh, the, for, for working with gene ontology that are pre available from the gene ontology websites. Um, one that I like, if you're just inter if you have a gene ontology term and you want to know more about it, um, I like this QuickGo website where you can type in the term and then it will tell you more about it. Um, lots of details 
the definition of the, the, t the term, how it's related to other terms, in, uh, all the proteins that are annotated to that term, proteins that are annotated, uh, um, terms that, are, that, that commonly annotate <coughs> these proteins, not, not only this term, so it'll find related terms. Uh, there are also other ontologies. So gene ontology captures three main aspects of function, as I mentioned, where you know, cellular component, where things are expressed, biological process, pathways, and molecular function. Uh, and, um, but there are other ontologies like uh, cell type ontologies, for instance, or uh, you might be interested to know if a protein is expressed in different cell types, uh, or the, um, there's, a, there's a few different, different types here. So this is, um, uh, just to let you know that gene ontology is not the only ontology. There are a number of others out there. M most of the other ontologies People have made the ontologies, but they haven't done as good, a, as complete a job as gene ontology to annotate the terms to all the genomes. So some of them, they have done a really good job. Like for instance, the human phenotype ontology is getting to be much more useful these days. They have uh, a, they have terms about all sorts of everything related to human phenotypes, basically. So, um, uh, um, you know, long fingers, short fingers, uh, uh, different types of. There's thousands of terms about. Um, human phenotypes. And then they also annotate genes to those, those terms. Okay, so gene ontology is a primary source of information about pathways, uh, in addition to the pathway databases, which we'll talk about more tomorrow. And um, there are lots of other properties available for genes, as I mentioned. And l fortunately, we don't have to go to a different database for all of these. A lot of them are present in central uh, genome browsers, like Ensemble, um, Entree gene, um, individual model organism databases, and uh, I noticed that there's quite some diversity in the organisms that people study in the class and also the technologies that, are, that people are using, so this is a good time to just mention that um, the, the course focuses on eukaryotic systems uh, because that, those are the most well-developed, but the, the concepts in general are uh, widely applicable, and the, um, we might focus on specific databases, but during the lab uh, or any time, you can ask uh, instructors or TAs to recommend additional um, software that might be compatible with your technology or, uh, or, or organism. Okay, um, so uh, Ensemble Biomart is one of these genome browsers that, uh, Ensemble is a genome browser that makes available a lot of information about genes, and it's a great place to access and information about your gene list. Uh, they have a, a tool called Biomart. How many people have used Biomart before? Okay, so a few. Um, how many people have never heard of Biomart? Okay, so m m many more than gene ontology. So Biomart is, a, I, I really like it because it's, um, it's a very powerful tool to get information about a, a list of genes. You can give it, uh, upload your list of genes, and you can ask for all sorts of information, like. Um, chromosomal location, gene ontology terms, uh, protein domains. You can also get uh, DNA and protein sequences, um, var variations, mutations that might be associated, homologs in many different other organisms. So it's a good way of getting converting your gene list from one species to another, for instance. Um, and the um, I've just put like a little workflow here. The way this works, the first time people use this website, it's often I don't think it's very intuitive the first time you use it. But once you get the hang of it, after just following one once through this, you can. Um, it's much easier the second time. So you need to select your genome, your genes database, and then your genome. And then once you've done that, um, you can select your filters, which is uh, Ensemble Biomart starts with. The idea is that it starts with the whole genome, and you have to tell it what part of the genome you're interested in. So one way you can select filters is say, give me all the genes that are matching a gene ontology term, and it'll just give you those genes, and so it'll, it'll get a smaller uh, set of uh, subset of the genome. Another way you can do that is by providing your gene list, and it will just give you the genes in the genome matching your gene list. So that's usually what's, what's useful for us, and then we can um, select the attributes to download, and this is where you go shopping, which is why it's called Biomart. You just kind of pick a whole bunch of information that you want and you download it and it can be downloaded in spreadsheet format or other formats. Exactly what you want. Yeah. 
So that's a great point. So for, per, for people who are doing scripting, um, the, there's these nice scripting interfaces, and you don't even have to figure out how to script it. You can just go to the website, make your query, and then, and then get the script, the code that would run that for you, um, at least the query, the query part. OK, so just to summarize, um, there are many uh, attributes available in databases. I talked about gene ontology, but we'll talk a lot more about pathway databases tomorrow and other, other databases throughout the, the course. Um, and, uh, and, and Ensemble and, and Entree Gene are good sources for, for a lot of this information. In particular, this Ensemble Biomart is fairly handy. Um, this just summarizes some of the, the issues that come up with gene ontology, um, just because it's complicated. Uh, it's, um, there, but there's, there's, it's not that complicated once you know this, sort of understand the structure. OK, so um, that's basically it for the morning um, session. I think we were supposed to end at 10.15, right? Yeah. So um, the, um, we, we've in the past had a lab uh, related to this first part of the lecture, but we have, in response to feedback that we got from previous courses, we've, uh, uh, we don't have the lab anymore for this section because people thought it was too easy and, and, and we'd, they'd rather use the time for the more um, uh, interesting analysis in later courses. So we still include a lab if you're interested. You can try out these these tools and um, and this is just a little little set of things to try out. Um, the um, um, with with your gene list, for instance, uh, there might be this. I don't. I can't remember if this gene list is now on the on the wiki. Okay. So yeah, this was. Um, put this up on the wiki just to, to try it out, um, the small set of genes. Uh, and so you can do this on your own time uh, and ask questions about, about this. Okay, any other questions?